Hello everyone, my name is Anna Brees. I'm very excited indeed about this interview. I'm going to be speaking to Catherine Gunn, who is in Turkey. Um, what is the date today? I always see the date, the 12th of May. Um, you are one of the few celebrated whistleblowers, I have to say. You contacted me on Facebook, um, and I was obviously very flattered to hear what you said about the work that I've been trying to do. Uh, in particular, you saw the interview I did with Robert Stewart, where we talked about a media whistleblower, someone who left the BBC in 2010 with serious concerns over false reporting in uh, conflict areas such as Syria. Um, thank you very much for getting in touch with me and for, for saying that you, you like what we're doing, what I'm doing. Um, first of all, we, we should just remind people who you are. You were in the film Official Secrets. You were played by Kira Knightley. You were basically, that film only existed really because of the, the brave actions that you took back in 2003. So yeah. first of all, really, I, um, I just want to say thank you for getting in touch. Thank you for your courage. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you feel now looking, you know, looking back at that film, the fact that it has come out, um, whether you feel uh, whistleblowers are really listened to enough and celebrated enough. And, um, you know, obviously you were, you were one of the few success stories. How do you feel right now looking at that film coming out and uh, how whistleblowers are treated now? Well, it's a good question because for... You know, for most of the time after, before the film came out, I was just trying to lead a quiet, normal life, you know, because I didn't do it in order to get any kind of recognition of myself. I just wanted to bring the issues into the public domain, you know, because I felt so strongly about the fact that the war wasn't necessary and that the lies that were being told and the way they were trying to manipulate the diplomatic processes in order to get uh, UN authorization and legitimacy for the war, that's why I exposed it. And it was nothing to do with, you know, wanting to be at the forefront of that kind of exposure myself. And I think that's usually what most whistleblowers, what they're motivation is what their purpose is they they bring an issue forward because it really matters to them it's a red line that they refuse to cross and they feel it needs to come out and they don't actually want their story necessarily to be highlighted they want the issues to be resolved and you know that that's what has been ongoing and it continues to be a problem you know, until that when the film came out last year and I finally felt I was able to talk about it more openly without any kind of uh, emotional kind of traumatic um, tension within myself, then I was, you know, free to go out and talk about it and um, go to conferences and go to um you know, screenings of the film and take questions and answers after it in a, a large public audience. Um, and finally, I was able to, you know, get over the sort of slight PTSD that I had immediately after the case was dropped against me. Well, this and I think lots of people have the same kind of experience. You know, they get quite a lot of... Um, sort of trauma because of the way that they're retaliated against or the way that they're pushed out and blackballed after that by their industry um, and then not being able to actually pursue a career that they were once in because none of those industry insiders see them as part of their um, you know parts of the industry they want them in because they want to keep a lid on these issues. They don't want people who feel the need to expose wrongdoing and, you know, criminal behavior. Well, you were heard and you were recognized and celebrated, but like you say, you, you made it a selfless act. There are so many people that had the information. So you, you had a memo, didn't you? Can you just, recap about the information that you saw and what was going through your mind and what gave you the courage to do something about it. Um, Cause obviously you weren't the only person that saw that information. What makes you, what makes you different? Do you think what makes whistleblowers different to, to do that where they're putting their careers at risk? Um, they may lose an income 
why do you think you were different and how many other people saw the information that you did? Well, I can't say for certain how many people saw it, but I think probably around 100 people maybe were in receipt of that email. And, you know, I had, this was about February, this actually, no, the email came into my, or I saw it in my inbox on the 31st of January, um, 2003. And, you know, up to that point, there had been a, quite a strong sort of um, media media campaign, let's say, and the gov in sync with the government's um, sort of public pronouncements about the necessity to disarm Iraq, to disarm Saddam Hussein, and you know how all, all this sort of build up, this rhetoric that was building up. Um, to the crescendo of war. And I started looking into it because I thought, you know, they'd invaded Iraq, they bombed Iraq um, once already about 10 years ago prior to that. And then they imposed sanctions that were genocidal, which were, you know, reported by the UN um, heads of those programs who resigned in um because they were appalled at the fact that these sanctions were actually literally killing so many millions of children. And, you know, I thought, how, how then can a state that has been so decimated, how can it launch attacks on the UK? How can it be a threat to British national security? And so, when, you know, the, the more I researched, the more I read, the more I thought that was, um, it just didn't stand up to scrutiny, the claims that they were making. Well, in, so the, when in, I the saw film, in the film, Kira Knightley's sitting watching the television, isn't she? And she's watching Tony Blair eating a dinner, I think. And she's shouting at the TV. And you were, whether that's true or not, obviously, but you weren't the only person thinking that. We were all thinking that, you know. And yeah, exactly. Every, a lot of people. I mean, I wasn't alone in thinking that. And presumably I wasn't alone in thinking that, um, even, you know, working within the intelligence services and for the Ministry of Defense. Presumably I wasn't alone. And in fact, you know, you can see now that, um, you know, MI6 and other intelligence services were warning the government uh, that the, the facts didn't stack up. And, and that famous uh, dossier, you know, that the BBC got hauled through the um, coals over because they accused the government of sexing up the dossier, well, you know, whether the words are accurate, that's beyond the point. The fact is they did. They took out all the caveats. They took out all the words that made the, the case less watertight in order to firm up the government's position in attacking Iraq. So basically, when I saw the memo, and the memo basically was from the National Security Agency in the U.S., and they wanted GCHQ to um, assist them in uh, basically eavesdropping on the domestic, the home phone numbers, the home, home phones and the um, office phones of six diplomats who were sitting on the UN Security Council at the, at the time, six uh, nations, it was on a, it's on a rotating basis. And, um, and it said in the email to use the whole gamut of information that would give U.S. policymakers an edge in obtaining results favorable to U.S. goals. And when I saw that, that specific sentence, it made me think, you know, their goals are invasion and they want a legitimate authority like the U.N. to give them a kind of cover, legal cover for um, making that war legal quote unquote. So as soon as I saw that, it was like a red flag to a bull. And I felt, you know, I was in, I was enraged by what I'd read. Um, the, the way it was politicizing intelligence gathering for the specific purpose of, um, of giving legal cover for a war, which has had spurious grounds, legally speaking. So that's why I leaked it. And to be honest, I I kind of went into a, a tunnel vision, if you like. I felt like uh, it was an all-consuming issue and I could think of nothing else. And I literally, I didn't really consider the consequences to myself because 
I was trying to do it anonymous, anonymously. So, you know, it, although um, I knew what I was doing was um, breaking the law, I felt I had to do it in order to try and protect myself. But I wasn't thinking about what if I get found out and what will happen to me then. That, that seemed of little importance. It didn't even occur to me. Um, which I, I guess is, you know, the one reason it was, it happened. I mean, if I, I, th I think if I happened to seriously consider my, the consequences of my actions, it, it might potentially have stopped me, you know, because they're, they're so um, threatening. And I think that most people who've been in a job long enough to realize what happens to people who agitate, what happens to people who um, try to bring issues to the um, forefront of their organization, try to raise concerns about issues, what happens to them is that they get sidelined or, or you know, they don't get promoted or, you know, eventually they get pushed out. And so people internalize that after a period and they start to think, well, it's not worth my while to do that because I've got to pay the mortgage. I've got to pay my kids university education. I've got to do this and that and the other. And so it, it just, the balance becomes untenable. I've met a few brave people who have been selfless and had the courage to do it. And yes, the consequences have not been too fantastic for them. Like you say, uh, they're seen as troublemakers. They find it difficult to get out of the job. Um, but they do it because it's the right thing to do. What I really would like to talk to you about is the fact that 17 years on, things aren't really that different, are they? And I've spoken to whistleblowers um, within the, the media. Um, I'm sure there are people at GCHQ now that have information as horrific as what you had, it would, that they would like to blow the whistle. Do you feel disheartened that uh, the situation is as it is, you know, 17 years later, and we've seen further conflicts and pushing regime change in places like Syria, do you feel that uh, it's got worse? Actually, actually got worse. You know, how, you know, I, I've done a lot on the child abuse cover-ups, establishment cover of child abuse, what happened with Jimmy Savile. I know a reporter called Miriam Jones, who said that those who were on the right side of it, trying to expose Jimmy Savile were seen as traitors. And the people that kept quiet, they were the ones given promotions. They're the ones that kept their jobs. Um, children, you know, lives are at risk. Children yeah. are dying. Uh, wars are happening and the British public and the, the public all over the world are being fed information that is that is not true and how do you feel now 17 years on that the situation is still so grim yeah it's uh, it's quite it can be quite depressing because you know you do feel as though uh, we're on a sort of very downward slippery slope and regardless of all the efforts by human rights activists, by, you know, peace organizations, by um, people who campaign for um, freedom of information and transparency in government and so on, you know, it, it's very difficult to see um, any positive gains. And I think um, specifically in terms of national security whistleblowing. I mean, it, in many countries, there are um, certain protections available for whistleblowing within industry, for example, and within um, non-security uh, related, non-intelligence related civil service. Um, but the actual results, even though there are protections available for them, um, in terms of the law, like uh, public interest disclosure and all those sorts of um, whistleblowing protection um, laws. But in actual fact, they still do get retaliated, um, retaliation. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's, um, it's a very slow, gradual process that seems to me the industries that, um, pay lip service to whistleblowing and um, government authorities who also pay lip service to transparency and accountability and so on. Um, it seems to me that they're very, very slow to enact change. And so it's, it's up to the public and it's up to um, 
organizations that campaign on these issues to keep forcing this to the front of the agenda because what is so crucial about this is that if you don't have a free flow of information and if you don't have accountability and transparency, which is becoming increasingly obvious in the UK, um, especially with surrounding this issue uh, around the, you know, the um, lockdown measures in the UK and the coronavirus um, bill and the fact that the actual reporting from the government's own agency, the SAGE group, is being redacted, you know, for, and for what you know the, the way the government is behaving in the uk currently is, is very arbitrary and it's very uh, non-accountable and and it's you know i think it's crucial that we don't get um kind of trapped in the weeds of what is happening at a at, at a sort of um basic level in terms of the um coronavirus issues and forgetting the bigger issue which is what will this what impact will this have on society as a whole when we move past this you know the type of government the way the government is conducting its business now i was is a very dangerous precedent isn't it because they're they're basically dictating to the public as though they are the parent and the public is touch our children and they are dictating policy it's not debated anymore it's not you know it's not scrutinized it's not peer-reviewed in many instances and it's just being broadcast to the nation as if we're, we're children and and have to take orders from the adults in the room and i, I think that's that's where we're at and that's incredibly worrying to me well absolutely and there's so many different issues that we could talk about obviously there's iraq there's syria for me i have a huge interest in in covering the westminster pedophile ring and now we're in a crisis with coronavirus and there's lots of information because obviously we have platforms like this youtube you know i'm a former bbc and itv uh, employee reporter trying to do what i can to get information out there that's clear, but also put pressure on these organizations to uh, assist with the research and listen to whistleblowers and, to, um, and to, to be a lot more intelligent about the way they put stories together. I, one thing I really wanted to talk to you about, and I was talking to an MP called Andrew Bridgen, and he's got a huge amount of information that he's been desperate to try and share with the media in particular. And I've heard stories from him that were truly, truly unbelievable. Um, you wouldn't believe that that took place within government, you know, relating to numerous issues, especially to do with, with child abuse cover-ups. But he said, who will run it? He t gives me this information, and uh, but he said, who will run it? And I went, what do you mean? Obviously, he said that news organisations now are not listening to whistleblowers and they're not doing adequate research and, and, and they're kind of insulting the the, the in intelligence of the public because you have this information on Facebook, YouTube um, and, and other platforms and it's not being reflected by the media that we for, for so long trusted, the legacy media. Um, I know we've talked before about how you've been on RT and Professor Piers Robinson and Tim Hayward and other individuals who've been trying to kind of uh, talk about propaganda issues and false reporting in conflict zones like Syria. The only place they have been able to talk is, is somewhere like RT and they've been smeared for it. That's actually seen as a smear. You know, if you, you're just desperate to get this truth out there, you'll talk to whoever, obviously. Um, so, yes, we may have RT talking to these whistleblowers or uh, people with very serious concerns over propaganda and, and false reporting from conflict zones. But we, we are then, you, you can be then smeared. It's seen as a, as, a, as, a, as a bad thing, you know, talking to Sputnik or RT. Um, you haven't been interviewed, have you? And, you know, your story, which has been celebrated in this film, your role was played by Kira Knightley. I know she was very supportive, um, very involved in the promotion of the film. So you, you, do you feel people don't have trust in the media? As a whistleblower, where would you go? What media organisation would you go to? Um, what, why did you make the decision that you did to go to the media organisations you chose? Well, I didn't choose a media organisation. Um, I mean, at the time... Uh... I, I myself had a strong distrust of the media because that sort of 
um, instilled into you when you work at places like GCHQ that you, you basically don't touch the media with a barge pole. Um, and because GCHQ is based in, you know, not in London, in Cheltenham, um, it's sort of excluded almost from, from the day-to-day, -day, the sort of the Westminster and the Whitehall and the whole, you know, London scene of politics and media. So I actually passed it on to somebody I knew who then gave it to Yvonne Ridley, who, you know, as you know, is a journalist. Um, and, and that's how it winded its way to the Observer. Um, I think it's, you know, back then there was no WikiLeaks, for example, um, when I was, when I leaked my information. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, I think WikiLeaks is, is a great place to start if you want to um, try and um, release information. But you, basically you have to bear in mind really that there is this huge risk attached to leaking information, um, which means that you could very um, possibly be prosecuted. Um, and so, you know, what I have been working on, what I've, what I had hoped with the um, promotion of the film and on the back of the film was to try and focus attention on changing the law so that there would be protections for in particular national security whistleblowers um, from within the intelligence and you know military um, I agree with you, but my, my really serious concern Catherine is that the media organizations don't run these stories yeah, it's and I, the media too high, definitely... Too high risk, too much trouble. Um, they, they're just not interested. They, I, have tried to, I have tried to send such stories to so many media organisations and, uh, and I despair. I really do despair. And I think we need to focus really strongly here on the media. And I'm not... You know, we've got um, Trump, for example, saying, you're fake news. You know, it's so important uh, at the moment, Media Trust. But you're... They're not running these stories, but they're going to lose trust and people. Yeah. And I think they're steadily losing trust. I think you're right that people are steadily um, coming to the conclusion that there is just as much, if you like, fake news or uh, uncorroborated news on uh, the mainstream media as as there is potentially in anything that's on the alternative media side. I mean, I think. It, it's easy to, it, you cannot tar everybody with the same brush, obviously. And there are still some very decent, hardworking um, journalists in the mainstream media who are just clinging on by their fingernails, trying to, you know, because perhaps they feel uh, their stories, if they, if they stay within those, um, in, 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 within those um, media, they can, affect greater change perhaps because they think they have reached a, a larger audience for example um there may be some truth to that uh and they need to be supported and applauded for what they're doing i think because it's it's at you know risk to themselves but i think alternative media is definitely picking up the baton and there are various other websites i mean there's um you know off guardian uh there's the um various organizations that are trying to put forward stories um from researchers that are basically independent independent investigative researchers and um you know i think i don't know whether they will pool their resources because at the moment they're they're sort of sprouting up everywhere there's lots of different independent websites that are each doing their own kind of specific um, investigations and they're all asking for donations right to keep their websites going and that's great i don't know what the outcome of that will be whether there will be winners and losers um, in in trying to keep hold of an audience and keep hold of subscribers I don't know whether it's possible that for those groups to then kind of work together in a bigger collaborative sense and pool their resources, because I think that way, you know, they, they may have more impact. So you have Mint Press News, for example, you have, like I said, Off Guardian, you have The Intercept, which 
has very big financial backing already. But, you know, various other organizations, if you can pull them together and kind of work in a collaborative way, I don't know whether that will generate the sort of a bigger powerhouse of an alternate, um, you know, an alternative to the mainstream. When, media. Well, when was the alternative media going to become mainstream? And I, I don't think it's really down to views. I mean, I work with someone called Alistair Bunkle at Sky News and he said, we're still so powerful. We're still getting all these views. But yes, they may get millions of views. That doesn't mean people believe what they're listening to. I watch the BBC. Doesn't mean yeah. they believe and trust what they're saying. My mum and dad buy the Daily Mail every day. Doesn't mean they believe and trust what they're reading. Um, and I'm not even sure it can be called alternative anymore. I really do see right. that this weighing scales, you know, the old fashioned weighing scales, it's starting to tip. And there was a right. YouGov um, research recently that showed that 50% of the public believe in the, trust the BBC and 50% don't. And I just yeah. see in a crisis situation like this as well so much more interest in media trust and information because we're all suffering we need answers we need to know when this is going to end and when it ends will, we, will there be a, a massive impact to surveillance and censorship these are two big issues that i'm focusing on at the moment um censorship seeing people deplatformed um you know professionals and academics trying to get their information out about coronavirus um that is that is different to the official narrative um and obviously surveillance in, in terms of do we have to all download these contact tracing apps? I spoke to a professor in computer science at the University of Birmingham. You know, I asked him directly, mm -hmm. do you think that uh, we're going to have to have these contact tracing apps? And he said, yes, to go to work, to get on public transport, to go into the supermarket. That frightens me. Um, so it's so important at the moment that journalists are just open minded and it's very, very difficult, though, to accept that you may be wrong or you work for an organization that has made huge mistakes. But I'm very much like you. I don't think we need to throw out the, the baby with the bathwater. Is that the saying? You, you, we need reform, I think, within these media organizations. We need to come forward and say, yes, we've got this wrong. But for, for me, what's very difficult at the moment, I've been talking to Robert Stewart, we'll be looking at this program called BBC Panorama, Saving Serious Children from 2013. And if you look at the evidence and the work that he's done over the last six years, there's very few people that would not be able to come to the conclusion that the BBC filmed a staged event. Now, it was an independent production company run by someone called Darren Conway. That um, wasn't... Uh, the media whistle where we spoke to thinks that the reporter Ian panel wasn't aware of what was going on. I know other respected journalists have looked at the rushes and don't believe that they did film a fabricated event, but it, there is... There was a lot in there for me, it tips, tips to me. I, looking at the evidence, me personally, I think they did. Um, it takes quite a long time to look into all of the evidence that Robert's put forward. But if they did, and I have written to um, my former boss, Michael Jeremy, who's the head of ITV News and Current Affairs. He employs someone called Tom, called Tom Giles. Tom Giles was the editor of that BBC Panorama programme. Um, are they going to come forward and say, yes, we made a mistake here. This is... We have filmed a staged event. Uh, we weren't aware at the time that ITV and BBC would be implicated and trust in those organisations would just completely disintegrate, especially at a time like this. So, you know, I think often think to myself, what if I had become a senior BBC executive and I was privy to this information? Would I actually come forward and say, yeah, we made a mistake here. Um, we, we'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Or will I just, would I just stay quiet? Um, and just hope it goes away. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I think obviously it, it all boils down to your individual circumstances at the time and, and whether it's the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, you know, if that's the last straw and you just can't take, if it's been going on for, for a long time and you've finally become so disillusioned or whether it was the first time you became aware to such a thing and, and you think, oh, well, that's a one-off, it, it you know can't possibly be routine or, you know, there's all kinds of different angles on, on what makes a person decide to bring it forward but i think you know that the facts of the matters are clear that there is no incentive there's literally no incentive to blow the whistle and unless there is a complete change in the way that we view the issue of blowing this whistle um if un unless we see it as a kind of um a patriotic or a even a rational, sensible thing to do. For example, if you're um, 
if you're leaking information about some incredibly um, you know, corrupt behavior within your organization, which is then leading to the um, eventual financial ruin of your organization. Because you, know, you could see, for example, this knock-on effect on the BBC is that maybe you'll have a rebellion in terms of people refusing to pay their licensing fee, you know? I mean, people might get to the point where they think, we, well, why should we keep paying the TV license fee if we don't actually want to watch BBC programming anymore? I, I mean, that's, that's the odd thing. I think that's happening already. So right, and so, so their, their funding collapses, and then what happens, you know? So, so it's, a, it's taking a long-term view, and it's saying to, to people that, if we start rectifying what has gone wrong and if we start to um, to actually bring back the people who we've pushed out because we felt they were agitating too much or they were you know troublemakers by revealing uh, inconsistencies inaccuracies you know mismanagement and so on if we start bringing those people back in and rewarding them you know, not in necessarily financially, but in, you know, giving them their positions back or, you know, um, listening to them and actually, you know, um, recommending the changes that should take place and so on. That's when you start to see the balance move back towards, you know, bringing back trust in the media, I think. But if they keep... Uh, basically blackballing the people who are flagging up the... Yeah, they're just doing this. Go away, go exactly. away. It's the head in the sand thing. And it, you know, ultimately, you know, the worst case scenario is that the BBC gets broken up and privatised. Uh, and some people might think that's great. Um, personally, I think, you know, I, it, it would be a great shame because the BBC has the potential to to be a very good service. They have, you know, so many hundreds of thousands of trained staff and, and, you know, they have so much historic kind of archives. They really could be a force for good in the sense that they involve everyone. They involve the community and they're not um, simply a mouthpiece for number 10 or the cabinet office or you know the the top um sectors of society if they involved everybody and were shown to be more transparent and accountable then they would they could be a, a, a force for good but unfortunately as you say it's a head in the sand type of attitude they have at the moment and the worst case scenario is the whole thing gets broken up and sold off into private enterprises and I don't think that that's, that's a good thing. They need to listen and they need to engage with people like yourself and with the public and reflect public opinion and mood. Listen to whistleblowers, listen to victims and survivors of abuse, start covering the stories that we're talking about. Um, and I find when I do speak to former colleagues that, that have gone on to ITN, Sky, BBC, they can get angry, they can be often very arrogant, very smug, and they smear the individuals that have come forward for this information instead of calmly listening in a balanced way. Um, and I, what upsets me, and I've seen this so many times, is those people who have been brave enough to come forward, they haven't been celebrated like you, Catherine, these whistleblowers. Um, and they've become, they don't have peer support and they can end up getting very, very disheartened because like you said, what is the incentive? What right. is the incentive? They're not celebrated, they're not listened to. Um, they're not recognized, they lose their jobs, and then they can become more angry and, and, and more conspiratorial. And right, no, absolutely. There's no balance at the moment. There's these, right. these, these, these professional journalists and media organizations feeding us a particular line, and we're seeing something very different on Facebook and Twitter and social media, and um, there's this massive, massive divide. And it is about listening and engaging with the things that people care about and the problems that they've got. And you talk about not having an incentive, okay? Whistleblowers not having an incentive. I completely disagree. 
because in, the incentive should be our children and our future. Yes, there may not be financial incentive or professional. You know, you may not get promoted. You may not have the wonderful career that you would hope for. But at the end of the day, you have a conscience. You can sleep uh, at night. And like, that's why I know you did. That's why I have spoken to people I have, why I've come out and said what I have. is because I can go to bed at night and I know one day when I leave this earth, I don't know when it will be, I've made the world a better place for my children. That is my incentive. Yeah, I mean, that's one way to look at it. And I suppose, you know, I, I was very fortunate that obviously, um, you know, my story did come out 17 years later in a film that, you know, I could never have dreamt of possible at the time. Right. But, um, you know, and I, I haven't um, been sort of terribly treated by um, by the British government or anything like that, not like Julian Assange, for example, um, which is, you know, another thing that the, the media has been extremely slow to come forward and support because, you know, the, it's an actual direct attack on their profession. You know, if, if Julian Assange, for example, kept Wood is extradited to the US and is charged, which he would under, uh, under the um, court that he would be in, which would be in the actual um, security center, the heartland of the US security state, you know, the jury would be stacked against him. He would definitely get charged. Uh, for all all the charges that are reigned against him, and he'd be locked away for good for a hundred and what is it, seventy seven years or something? They're saying. So you know, media organisations need to come forward and say, you know, enough is enough. Um, we need to protect freedom of information. We need to have um, an adult. If we want an adult liberal democracy, which is what we're constantly told, you know, we're living in is a is a liberal democracy but you know if we want to if you know politicians are to be believed that we're living in a adult liberal democracy we need to have we need to see we need to see that that, that that's the truth you know and the the way to show that we're living in a liberal democracy is um is to have all all views open to discussion right? It's to allow these topics to be open for debate. And it's not to play this for or against type of uh, dichotomy all the time, you know, that George Bush um, Jr. famously, you know, espoused at the beginning of the war on terror was that you're either with us or against us, right? And that it's, that it's that simple black and white type of um, debate that literally reduces reduces it down to to nothing you 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 can't have a debate when it's simply um us against them black versus white and so on Uh, and i think people are starting to realize that and people are hungry actually for information that is factual that is evidence-based that you know it, it is properly scrutinized and we're not stupid you know we can read through complicated um, arguments and make up our own minds what we think is the facts of the matter and I think until that becomes widely accepted and the you know mainstream media and governments start to realize that this is in fact what people are doing there's going to be no sort of resolution to this I think people have to you know for example I've challenged um, my father's MP, I've written to her and I've said that these are the arguments, um, you know, against lockdown, for example, and, um, you know, our human rights are being abused. We need to get involved and keep pushing. I think the whole point is not sitting back and expecting other people to do the work. It's getting involved ourselves, um, sharing information to people who may not agree with you and writing and emailing petitioning your representatives your mps your senators and trying to get them to actually represent you because that's that is their their role their role is to represent us not to represent 
big business, not to represent big media, not to re represent, you know, uh, the heads of state. Very, very good advice there. And it is difficult. I mean, where I live locally, the general mood is you know, to criticise anyone who thinks that lockdown should end. In Wales, it's, it's behind England and, and people are being um, shamed on social media if they go for a walk, you know. And um, it's difficult for me to come forward and say, look, I disagree with this. We need to use some common sense. People are really suffering, especially single parents, the self-employed, the elderly. Um, it is just not a voice that's being heard locally on Facebook. And just in a small way, you can just start, you know, trying to reflect a different opinion. And it's just, it's kind of, I just think a lot of it comes down to fear of being different. Yeah. It does. You don't want to be a troublemaker. You don't want to get into arguments. You want to be in the cool gang. You want to um, be accepted. You don't want to be different or, or make a fool of yourself. Um, and I don't have a problem with making a fool of myself. Um, and I have a lot of courage. And I want other people to start engaging some common sense, realizing, yes, they are powerful and they can make a difference. And your voice can be heard. Back in 2003, things were very different on the media environment. Very, very different. Things have changed. And we are seeing it happening at such speed at the moment during this crisis. Um, we do have a voice and we can bring about change. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we finish this interview? No, I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> and, um, and I hope it's, you know, I hope it's inspiring because I, I, I think it's easy to get down. I mean, I, I've got down. I, I've become, you know, really depressed on um, some days where all I do is cry I mean I, I can admit that you know I, I literally just feel such um, sometimes such a black mood come over but at the end of the day you know you wake up the sun is still shining the birds are still singing the flowers are still growing and so you know we have to keep um, keep using our voice until that literally they strangle our voice box you know as long as you have a voice you, you have to use it I completely agree Thank you so much. And I just hope that other whistleblowers will be celebrated one day in the way that you have. Um, and I, I hope you stay in touch and we'll definitely speak again. All right. Thank you, Anna. Take care. Bye. Bye.